Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. I have with me today an incredible man. His name is Dr. Jerry Bergman, and he has studied uh, in many, really, of the uh, different areas of science, haven't you, Dr. Bergman? That's true. And uh, we're going to talk today about irreducible complexity. Will you tell our guests what that is? Well, irreducible complexity is the idea that in order for something to function, it must have a certain minimum number of parts. A good example would be a human being. For a human being to function, it must have, absolutely must have, at least part of the brain. It must have a heart to circulate blood. It must have a certain level of blood. It must have certain organs so it can obtain nutrition, etc. So therefore, you can only reduce a human being so far before it no longer is alive. And that, of course, causes death. And we find when we look at the world that just about everything is irreducibly complex. And I should mention, this does not mean that one cannot remove a part. It's often assumed that irreducible complexity means you cannot remove a certain part. It says there's a certain minimum number of parts that is necessary in order for something to function. I conclude that everything is irreducibly complex except what they call the fundamental particles. One set is called quarks. And you may not be aware of that, but there are six basic kinds of quarks. There's top, bottom, strange, charmed, and up and down. Those are the six kinds of quarks. So they are fundamental particles. As far as we know, quarks are irre are, cannot be reduced farther. That's it. And the next one is leptons. And leptons we're probably more familiar with. There's electrons, neutrinos, at least electrons we're familiar with, tau neutrinos and muon neutrinos and so on. By the way, quarks are assembled to produce things like protons and neutrons. Uh, protons are two up quarks and a down quark produces a proton. And two down quarks and an up quark produces a neutron. And then there are bosons, and an example of bosons would be photons and gravitons. Everything in the universe is made out of these fundamental particles. And a common example is a mousetrap. It's a very simple example because you can notice if you take away the base, it won't function. It won't work. You must have the base. Now, people say, well, wait a minute. What if you take the base away and attach these particles, these parts here, the sections, to the floor? Well, the floor just becomes the base. Right. And I, I point that out to students because in chemistry, this is a central, central concept. And they notice right away, well, you still have a base. It's just the floor becomes the base. So a mousetrap is irreducibly complex for it to function, and we're talking about a mousetrap like this, which functions in a house to catch mice. People say, well, you can dig a hole and catch mice. That's true, but it's not very convenient to do in a house. <laughs> and periodic table, all of the elements are irreducibly complex. You must have a certain number of protons, electrons, and neutrons to produce all of the elements. And a good example is carbon-12. To get carbon-12, you must have six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. You cannot get carbon-12 any other way than have six protons, electrons, and neutrons. If you have a different number of electrons, guess what? We have an ion of carbon. We don't have a carbon atom. We have a carbon ion. If you have a different number of protons, you, of course, have another element. If you have a different number of neutrons, you have carbon-14 or carbon-9 or carbon 12. Okay, examples. Well, obviously, radios, to have a radio that functions, you must have a certain minimum number of parts. Television is a good example. When the television was invented, in order to get a television system that worked, you had to have a unit which would pick up the light, which would translate the light into electrical impulses, which would send the electrical impulses uh, through, the, through the air, and eventually. And then you have their receiver, which picked them up, which translated them back into light so you could see the, the television uh, picture. And uh, that's a good example. MRI and so on, another uh, example. Looking at this whole issue is the idea of intelligent design. All that says is that we can look for evidence of intelligence in nature. And the best example, the most common example, is the watch. The watch obviously was intelligently designed because, well, we can see the intricacy, the interconnectedness, and it's also irreducibly complex because if we remove a couple of these gears, it's not going to work. It's not going to function. And this is a good example. We're going now into a bacterium, and now we're going into the wall. This is the wall of the bacteria here. 
and now you can see parts are being built around it and these parts have to be manufactured somewhere else they have to be shipped to the work site they have to be assembled in the right place at the right time and they have to be put together so they stay together you now, can't just lay them down slow down and tell me that again that was a bacteria and in its wall what's being built this is a bacteria flagellum which is being built okay. and you'll notice there's lots of parts here yes all of which have to be available produced at the right time at the right place shipped to the right place and eventually, of course, we end up with this bacteria flagellum. This right here is a jig to make sure these parts are assembled properly. <laughs> and then this jig is left. It's moved out. Another jig is put in its place. And you'll see the other jig come in here in a second. Here we go. And this jig then allows the last part of it to be assembled properly. <laughs> there we go. And eventually, it becomes longer and we have the bacteria flagellum and there we can see this is the bacteria body itself in this case we have it looks like four, uh, four flagellum which allows the bacteria to move around uh, kind of like a tail and here we can see how the flagellum itself is built up now, it looks pretty simple but it's pretty complex it is pretty complex and these are the parts you can see this is D0, D1, D2 D3, these all have to be manufactured at the right place, assembled at the right time, and once they're assembled, then it, of course, functions as a movable, flexible tail, which we can see here in a second again. I've often wanted students to make a model of this. You could assemble it without glue, and this whole thing would function. And here you can see in more detail the jig. And we can see then the bacteria flagellum. All the parts are named, so we know what they are. And these have all been studied individually, and we can then look at how it is assembled and how it functions. <laughs> That's amazing. The complexity of that is absolutely amazing. They call it a protein motor. And here you can see more details, the same thing. And this right here, this bacteria, this is E. coli, and this has a single bacteria flagellum. And there you can see more details. When one looks at this, it looks like it was designed and built. Looks absolutely. like it was manufactured. Engineered and, and then designed and built. Engineered, right. Yeah. And this has caused a lot of people to just be amazed at the design and the intricacy of even in bacteria. And this is an actual photograph, a transmission electron microscopy photograph of the bacteria flagellum. So we can see indeed that these drawings, with previous were drawings, the drawings are fairly accurate in showing actually the detail that exists in the bacteria flagellum. It really does. That's amazing. And another example is uh, the Helicobacter pylori, which causes ulcers, also is a flagellated bacterium. And the bacteria motor, when we examine it in detail, we find it's again very complex. It has protein rings, it has a inner and outer membranes, it has uh, uh, stators, rotors, and many parts which we're familiar with. In fact, the rotor alone can operate at 6,000 to 17,000 RPMs, and it can stop almost instantaneously and reverse itself. So there's a motor on this, uh, I'm helping with the words, flagellum, that, in other words, this little, this little motor comes out of the back of a bacteria. Right. It must be so minuscule, we must be multiplying that thousands and thousands of times. It's a nano machine, right. And it lives inside of you. Out of our body, right. And, e. coli it can, and, and it can motor around inside your fluids? It spins around and it's able to locomote wherever it goes for various reasons. And it's made of dozens and dozens of parts. Yeah, quite a few parts. And how do evolutionists explain this? Co-option. Well, they basically say that some other structure, such as a type 4 pili or a type 2 uh, secretory apparatus or type 3 secretory apparatus, this is most commonly used to explain it. And they say that this co-opted or utilize other parts from other systems in order to build this. So in other words, this was here and it evolved by borrowing parts from other parts of the bacteria and therefore assembled these. The problem with that is though, is that really is an engineering concept. When engineers build something, they often don't produce parts from scratch. They look in catalogs and see what parts will fit buy these parts and then utilize these in order to engineer what they're trying to. For example, micro switches. There are catalogs which have thousands of micro switches and when you need a micro switch basically what you do is look in the catalog and say well this one will fit. 
but that is done by intelligence. That's done by design. You look for what works for your system. Say, up, oh, this one will work. We'll order so many from the company. We'll utilize them in our experimental models. And if, we, uh, if it works appropriately, then we will order these for production. And the same thing is true here. Co-option must have intelligence. It must have a means of determining whether or not something works before indeed finally functions. But of course, Darwinists don't explain that way. They try to explain it that, well, parts were certainly ended up over here, and it worked slightly better, and so those were selected, and so other parts end up over here. But we don't see any evidence of that in uh, either bacteria or other animals. Parts are produced and put where they belong. They're not floating around, and they, they're, right. they're not such where they can be, oh, well, let's see. Let's use this part over There's here. There's no trial and error there. Everything is so precise. Right. It is. And yes. we don't see any evidence of trial and error today. No. And my... Study of this indicates that trial and error does not explain it. Now, this is what Stephen Jay Gould would call a just so story, which is not based on facts. It's based on somebody sitting down and saying, well, I think this might work. It's based on thoughts, on ideas. And another problem, too, that co option has is where did the parts come from in the first place? Co option just says that these parts were utilized in order to produce the flagellum, but that doesn't explain where they came from. So we still have that in, to uh, explain in order to utilize co-option as an explanation. And the parts must be assembled, must be assembled properly in the right place. They can't be upside down. They can't be the wrong way. They have to be assembled in such a way to where they fit into where they're supposed to go. And of course, they must have a minimum of parts to live. And this is the same problem that Darwin had. Darwin basically said that the solution is infinite variety. He thought that all life had an infant variety. And now we know that all life has very clear limits. Like you cannot, humans cannot be 25 feet tall. It simply is not feasible. And so therefore, we don't have infinite variety. We have variety, but not it's infinite not variety. infinite. Yeah. That's a good point. Pangenesis. And he came up with the idea of pangenesis, by the way, which has been proved wrong, which is a whole num uh, other presentation. In the flagellum, here we go. There's 23 new proteins, which as far as we know are not found anywhere else. So the idea of co-option, well, where do these 23 proteins come from? So you couldn't borrow them because they don't exist anywhere don't exist. else. So, so actually there is, there is a documentable fact that they can't be borrowed right. because they are nowhere else. Well, some are borrowed. Some are borrowed. But, some But there are, are 23 that have to be produced in that cell. Right. And are not found anywhere else. And about 70 specified proteins are needed for it to function. It takes 70 different proteins. 70 different proteins. Perfectly assembled in the right order and in the right space in order for this to work. If you have too many of these proteins, you have a problem. If you have too few, you have a problem. You have to have close to the right number or very close to the right number. And they have to be assembled at the right place, at the right time, in the right amount before it functions. Now, when you see evolutionists talking about this, Dr. Bergman, do you sense that they have confidence in their answer? Well, what they say over, and I've discussed this with many evolutionists, and they say, well, just give us time, we'll figure it out. You know, it seems like the more we know, the less likely evolution can be true. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. We have to take a break, but don't you go anywhere. We'll be right back. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. Man's framework and engineering marvel. The 206 bones in the human skeletal system are an engineering marvel. It is a rigid support for the body's organs and tissues, serving as a shield for the brain, lungs, heart, and spinal cord. Engineers are developing lightweight structural materials, but have yet to devise a substance that grows constantly, lubricates itself, requires no shutdown time, and repairs itself routinely. Is man's framework a product of random chance processes or the creation of a grand designer? Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Jerry Bergman, is the author of several books, including Slaughter of the Dissidents, Killing the Careers of Darwin Doubters, and Persuaded by the Evidence. For book orders, go to Amazon.com. Dr. Bergman has presented over 100 scientific papers at professional conferences, has over 800 publications, and is a frequent guest on radio and television programs. Dr. Bergman is also a professor at Northwest State College in Ohio, where he teaches biology and chemistry courses. For more information about our guest, 
you can write to Dr. Jerry Bergman at Northwest State Community College. His email address is jbergman at northweststate.edu. We are back with Dr. Jerry Bergman and we're talking about irreducible complexity. Dr. Bergman, we talk about IC and ID. Right. And uh, let's be sure that everybody's on board by what we mean by both those terms. Okay. ID is intelligent design, okay. which ID is a concept which basically stresses the, the fact that certain things you can look for evidence of intelligence, like a watch. And people who are supportive of this idea feel that you can also look for evidence of intelligence in life. I see means irreducible complexity and the term is used so much in science that you just say I see. You can remove certain parts but beyond that certain minimum and that's the key beyond that certain minimum it will not function. And the more complex something is the more of those parts there are. Right and the more difficult it is to find the, the, the position where indeed it doesn't work because certain parts can be removed but certain parts cannot be removed and that's actually what a lot of scientists have done in order to understand for example the functioning of the human body they remove a certain part and person dies and they say well gee this is necessary for life <laughs> whoops okay well you know I'm still kind of stunned by looking at our bacteria and the flagellum that came out of the back and the amazing thing that this is like a, a, a rotor, rotor motor right. it is that a can motor. make it go forward and backward, backward. and sideways can go at different speeds and, and uh, twist and turn. And the idea that that just happened by chance, uh, that's, I know that moves more to intelligent design than irreducible complexity, but it flabbergasts me that it seems to me, what I'm trying to say is that the more knowledge we have of how complex life is, the harder it is to believe it's here by random chance. Yeah, that's true. In fact, we found in looking at life that the more information we do research on and the more things we discover the more difficult it is to accept Darwinism yes. and a good example of that is when Darwinism was formulating his theory he had no idea of the complexity of the cell he thought the cell was about as complex as oh a bowl of jelly and there's an example of a cell this is the most complex machine in the universe is it one single cell one single cell people spend the lifetime studying not just the cell but also parts of the cell Basically, you have a nucleus here, and the nucleus has what they call pores. Pores allow certain things to go in and go out, and the pores themselves are very, very complex because they're selective in what they allow to go in and out. A nucleolus right here, which is where certain assembly functions occur. And then you have the ribosomes right here, the rough, what they call the rough ER. Then you have the smooth ER, which doesn't have uh, uh, ribosomes on it. And so they call it the smooth ER because it lacks ribosomes. The ribosomes are here on a section called the endoplasmic reticulum. So they call it the rough endoplasmic reticulum because the ribosomes are connected to this structure here. And then you have free ribosomes in various places. And you have the centrioles, which help the cell relative to coordinate cell division. And you have the cytoskeleton, which allows the cell to maintain some type of shape and help move things around. The mitochondria, right here, the mitochondria convert food into uh, ATP, which allows the cell to have a source of energy. And this is a very simple explanation of the cell because you can spend a lifetime just studying the mitochondria. I have thick volumes of hundreds of pages which just detail the structure and the function of the mitochondria. And of course, the question that screams to be asked is, can something that complex just happen? Right, that's the major concern that uh, people who are concerned about the intelligent design issue have. They conclude, no, it could not have occurred through evolution. It's one thing to come up with a theory, something else to defend it after you've based everything on it. But I, I don't think if we'd have seen how complex it is, anyone would even have uh, presupposed that it could have happened by chance. Yeah, and it's not just complexity alone. We're talking about design complexity. That's right. Or complexity that is not just a lot of stuff together, but stuff that is obviously it's there not for just a purpose. building it, it's engineering it. Right. Yes. And here's a good example. This is Kinesian, this little guy here. And it literally has legs here, and this is the leg. And it has feet here, which walk on this microtubule. And they carry supplies, materials, building supplies, and so on, from one part of the cell to another part of the cell. This is within the cell. Within the cell. And these little guys walk around carrying their loads to where the loads has to go. Because you remember that parts have to be assembled 
in one place and manufactured in one place and also assembled to produce the final product often in another place like the bacteria flagellum. And you have to produce a product because these cells die. Right. If there's continually replacement of all the parts of a cell, this goes on 24 hours a day. So it isn't just that a cell dies, but parts of it have to constantly be replaced. Right. There's a maintenance crew in there. A maintenance crew where it continually <laughs> replaces uh, parts that don't seem to need replacement. All right. But it's more or less on a time schedule. After so much time, these parts are replaced. All right. Okay, the court ruled, and this is a case in Pennsylvania, the Katzmiller case, uh, Dover Area School District, uh, and the judge ruled, quote, and I'll quote him, the argument of irreducible complexity central to ID intelligent design has been refuted in peer-reviewed research papers and has been rejected by the scientific community at large. Right. That's what he ruled. He said there are no peer-reviewed articles supporting Professor Behe, Michael Behe, Lehigh University's argument that certain complex molecular structures are irreducibly complex. But if you think about the material I presented, this is absolutely ludicrous. Yes. Because the fact is, everything, especially in chemistry, it's a major concept in chemistry, you have to help students understand the difference between carbon-12, carbon-14, between a carbon atom, between a carbon ion, and be carbon and boron are different. How are they different? And irreducible complexity, I should mention, by the way, has been around since Aristotle. They recognize that for certain things to function, you must have a certain minimum number of parts. What is that? Is it a one? Well, it looks like a one. Now what does it look like? A plus. Looks like a plus. Now That's what is it? It's a four. It? Looks like a four. My intention when I drew this was a four, but I didn't give you enough information in order to show you that, indeed, this is a four. You have to have all the parts. So you have to have all the parts. So That's right intuitively clearly things are irreducibly complex it's an idea that's been around for a long time it was central to chemistry development of chemistry and so on and this now has gotten in the media from the net uh, there's a quote from Amazon a review of a book B he quote started out with his conclusion and then set out to reinforce it okay well that may be true this explains why you get unsupported assertions such as irreducible complexity and when I plug this in by the way uh, irreducible complexity is false I got 293,000 hits so there are 293,000 hits which claim that irreducible complexity is false and of course that's ludicrous Dr. Behe is on to something isn't he Oh, I think he is. He's pointed out something which uh, Darwinists find very embarrassing, and therefore they try to discredit him by name-calling. But I think many re they must recognize that this concept is valid, it's scientific, it's supportable, and calling him names seems to be the main way they try to refute the argument. How long can we do that before the truth's exposed? Court decisions like Judge Jones, I think that's going to set back science for, for a while because people will say, well, nothing's irreducibly complex without really thinking about it. And the only way to prove that irreducible complexity is false is to get a human being that is made out of one single quark. <laughs> You're not going to do that. It's That's not going to happen. If I try to get a grant to prove that human beings can be reduced to one quark, I'm sure they would, wouldn't even read my grant. They would say, this is ridiculous. Can't do it. And think about it. It's impossible. You know, there's one irreducible truth that I'm holding on to. Dr. Bergman, and that is this. God is God, and he's in charge, and his truth will prevail. That's true. You know, my friend, it's so good having you with us today to hear Dr. Bergman and to see the scientific answers, the facts that support the, that there is irreducible complexity. Of course there is, and there is intelligent design. It's wonderful to know Jesus Christ as Savior and to know that designer. And I hope you'll hold on to the truth. You know, it's God's view that he created you. And that should be your worldview too. I hope you'll join me again soon here on Origins. Until then, God bless you, my friend.
Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 915 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 915, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.